Hello everyone and welcome to our panel. While everyone is talking about wins and success, we will rain on the research parade and talk about failures. With me today are four panelists, friends from our security research community. If you want to address any question to any of them, feel free to type them in the chat. So, thank you for joining me. Uh, I will let each of you to introduce yourself. Let's start with Irena. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Irena Damsky. I am the Director of Research for Cortex-XDR at Palo Alto Networks. I am also a co-organizer for the B-Sides Tel Aviv conference, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Iran? I'm a security researcher at CyberArk. I primarily focus on local privilege escalation bugs and on drinking cocktails. And there is a strong correlation between the two. The more I drink, the less bugs I find. Excellent. Sounds good. Ari? Hello. Uh, my name is Ari Eitan. I'm the VP of Research at Intezer, and I'm specializing in uh, malware analysis and reverse engineering. And it's a pleasure to be here. Good to have you. And last but not least, Sharon. <laughs> yeah, my name is Sharon Brzezinov. Uh, I'm a vulnerability research team at Clarity. Uh, we're doing mostly research on SCADA, SCADA devices, equipment, PLCs, HMIs, and we're trying to find vulnerabilities and disclose them to the uh, SCADA vendors. So this awesome panel is going to talk about um, failures, screw-ups, problems, all the things that we sometimes a bit timid about bringing out in the spotlight. Uh, I think the reason the four, the, the four of you are here is because you maybe want to share with us some interesting, interesting uh, uh, stories, maybe things that we can learn from. Um, and I think that uh, I would like to know why it is so important to you, Irena, for example, uh, to actually share not only the success stories that you see on a daily basis, but also the failures. So um, I think that uh, our math teachers at high school summarized it best. Basically, the most important thing is not just the final answer to the question, but also how you get there. Because the final answer might not be the exact correct number, but uh, along the way you get all the different steps and you you might have like the wrong turn and then you take the right turn and the wrong turn again. So you're talking but about the process. The process, the process of the research is, maybe and not necessarily the outcome of a, of a great, I don't know, zero day vulnerability, exactly. whatever. Exactly. Along the way, you'll find, you, you'll eventually get there. Okay. But you'll learn along the way a lot of stuff. Yeah. So it's very important. Interesting. So, Sharon, what is your take on that? Why, why exactly do we think that uh, we do want to actually share these failures? Yeah, so the way I look at it is how I consume research uh, information. So I mostly go to uh, Reddit NetSec or uh, some kind of Twitter accounts and read all the, these kind of uh, research publications that other great researchers are publishing. and. You'll never find any failure if anyone publishing uh, big wise, uh, I failed. I tried to do that, but I failed. I could not achieve uh, what, I, what I wanted. Uh, it's, it's like uh, the survivorship uh, bias that every, every research that uh, you read is a success story, uh, and you'll never find failures. But failures are there. Uh, we know that. I know that because I fail on a daily basis, but I learn from this. I learn what not to do next. And I think it's very important to share all these failures so others could learn and uh, not repeat on the same mistakes. Interesting. So, so you're talking about the, the survivor bias here. What you're trying to say uh, is we see all these success stories, but it doesn't mean that there are no failures. Right? Exactly. Underneath yeah. the surface of mm -hmm. this uh, aura of success, mm -hmm. of constant success. So if it's so beneficial to share these, uh, these stories, these failure stories or, or the painful mistakes that we do, um, why is it so easy for us to not publish or sometimes even uh, actively hide them, maybe? Ari? Yeah. 
Uh, that's a very good question, actually. I think it could be a bit embarrassing, you know, to share the fact that you failed. Although, as Sharon said, we failed on a daily basis. It's part of the job, you know. But the, the security research community is, is an amazing community, but it's very demanding. And, you know, to have your professional skills is maybe the basic. And if you're not sure in that and you share your failures, maybe something is, you could feel that something is not okay with you. But, again, we do it on a daily basis. That's, that's part of the, of the job. And once, we, once we'll put it on the table and it will be legit to talk about your failures, there are no longer failures, right? You make it, you make it a success story by sharing it, so. Okay. Iran, what do you think? Why, why, do, we, why do we hide our, our failures as a, as a go-to strategy? It's a very human thing to hide our failures, and I strongly think it's a mistake. It's very beneficial for us to admit our so-called past mistakes and uh, failures because we grow from that. Also, companies not just as personnel, like, for instance, Apple in the 90s developed over 100 different products, and when Steve Jobs got back, he decided to only continue with four of them. And then the company had major success stories because of that. You need to bury the old ideas to help you gain more focus on the good ideas. Okay. So the question is, by burying the old ideas, the bad ideas, aren't we missing something from, from learning from them? No, because when you do it, you need to do a proper burial ceremony. Mm -hmm. You need to understand what led you to this thing and to do like almost like a funeral for your own ideas and even like you can put them on a wall. Yeah. Yeah, you post need to do like post-mortem post -mortem analysis. Classic post-mortem. Seven days of Com shiva, have friends come over, and food, drinks. And for my story, <laughs> I can tell you that I had some times that I investigated something for a couple of months and then I needed to kill it, to say goodbye to it. And it's very, it's difficult on okay. the personal level. So, to so I think so. That's, a, that's an excellent segue to start um, the section of this discussion oh. where <laughs> everyone is here, to, here to, to join us and to hear your failures um, and the way you show them proudly. So, so Eran, you started to talk about the failure. Go okay, ahead. I'll start out with a glorious one. Mm -hmm. uh, in my work, I primarily focus on finding local privilege escalation bugs. And your base assumption when you do this kind of research that you start from a limited or low privileged user. And this time I was working on uh, Windows, so I was investigating a driver, which is a perfect place to look for uh, bugs. So on Windows, you communicate with a driver through a thing called a device object, not directly to the driver, and it has like permissions that say if you can open a handle to it. And you, communi you communicate to it through the handle. So the first thing that you need to do is to understand if you can get a handle to it. Then I got it, said to myself, great, let's look it up and kick it in uh, IDA. So I was reverse engineering the driver, and after around one hour, I found a bug that uh, crashed uh, the kernel. I got a blue screen, then I, think, I thought to myself, wow, great, let's continue. We're getting somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> we're getting somewhere. After two hours, I found two extremely powerful primitives like read, write, uh, where in the kernel. So those are the ultimate primitives that you want as a security researcher to find in the kernel. So I developed the exploit for one week or so, feeling pretty good to myself. I, I launched it and I got a system shell thinking to myself, wow, I'm a great researcher. <laughs> so I did the responsible thing and reported it to the vendor. After two weeks, I get an email saying, wow, it looks very interesting, but we have some hard time running your exploit. From some reason, we get an error code of five. And if you're familiar in error code in Windows, five means access denied. So I thought to myself, wait a second, what happened? I reran the exploit on my uh, guest machine and I got the same error. And then I said to myself, oh no. I looked at the first function in my exploit code and it was a create file to get the handle of the device and I got an access denied. Then I, I understand to myself that I did all those things, all the re-execution of the exploit from oh, an administrator no. shell. Oh no. oh no. Yeah, so the TLDR of the story is that I found very cool bugs in the kernels, but I did it from an administrator standpoint, okay. so we do so, not So stop. that is clearly an error that was your fault, Completely right? my <laughs> fault. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we don't need to talk in faults, but your responsibility, let's say that. <laughs> it's my responsibility, but 
from attacker's uh, standpoint, or if you're a red teamer, those bugs are still yeah, yeah, useful. of course, of course. <laughs> okay, so so this is the topic of of how we uh, shoot our own foot, right? Uh, so let's let's have another uh, example like that, Ari. Maybe you have something that you uh, sure. you managed to to create your own failure. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a bug that we had in the methodology research. At Intezer, we're focusing on malware analysis, and, and once in a while we get this new sample that we would like to investigate, and we discovered this, what seems to be a very interesting ransomware sample. No other vendor could detect it in VT, and we started to dive in, and it looks interesting. So we're digging more and more, and, and eventually we decided that it's interesting enough to write, to write something about it. And then we started the writing process, uh, we created a blog and so on, uh, uh, POC, but we took the time. To be honest, we, we, uh, it wasn't like uh, full gas, we, we took it easy. And uh, then we reached the marketing team, right? And we were like, hey, we have this interesting story, maybe we should reach uh, reporters and so on. Yeah, let's go, let's blow off the media, <laughs> PR, everything. This is right? it, this is what we've <laughs> been waiting for. Because this is the for. process, this is what we do. Exactly. Um, if you don't blog about it, it didn't happen. If you right. don't you need blog. to share the You need exactly. to share <laughs> with malware, the otherwise you didn't do Obviously. security exactly. research. We have this interesting finding, we want to share it. There's no point of having intel and keep it to yourself. Marketing are happy already. If marketing are happy, then we are happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, long story short, uh, we scheduled the publication for a certain day, and two hours before the, the launch, Another vendor published about this specific oh, sample no. uh, with a different name. They named it uh, uh, differently, and they basically took all the focus. Uh, the exact uh, same thing. Uh, the exact same sample. It was amazing, right? And and I, I really uh, take the responsibility to myself since I know that we didn't. It, it wasn't in a in super rush like. Yeah, you took we, your time. Yeah, we took the time. And, and, and why was the me. reason you took your time? Because. I thought, what are the chances that another what vendor is working? Yeah, yeah, what I, are the I, odds? I have a story about that. So we, we have a similar story. So we also had this amazing campaign we were researching. Like, we didn't take our time. We had this amazing campaign, and we had customers affected by it, so we couldn't take our time. Yeah. But it was in the wild, and um, we, we saw literal customers around the globe being affected by it. It wasn't with Palo Alto, so it's a different story. So, uh, but uh, it happened. Few so. more in the bag. Uh, does, but um, basically, it it happened a while back, and um, so we we had this really cool story. We were researching, and uh, we took our uh, took everything. We had all the data, and at some point, we decided, you know what, we want to do this more. We want to do this better. And uh, we reached out to some other vendors, and we wanted to share the information. Kind of and revisit the same research. Yeah, we wanted to do this, like we wanted to have better um, visibility into the data, and we wanted to share the data with them and to get their standpoint on it. Mm -hmm. So we had some limited visibility from the vendor I was working for, and um, so we had some limited visibility, and the other vendors we talked to had other visibility into that. And uh, so we did this joint publication, and we said, let's do this together. And we shared the signatures, and we collected data together, and we had this amazing, um, let's call it geo map or something, <laughs> and now we have, instead of like, only small visibility on the map. Now we have this beautiful map and all the different countries and all the different sectors oh, yeah. and everything. Geo mapping is always yeah yeah. We need we need to make marketing cyber, cyber happen, security right? style. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we need to do this pew pew map. Uh -huh. It's important. And um, then we since we're doing this in collaboration with several vendors, we need to make sure that all the vendors are publishing together. Right. And it's important. So we said, okay, you know what? We're gonna publish 9 a.m. Eastern time. And all the vendors are synced on it. And then 9 a.m. Eastern time comes and everyone is publishing together. The only vendor that didn't publish was us <laughs> because our marketing forgot because they were on the West Coast. Oh. <laughs> they didn't wake up. Time zones. Uh, yeah, time zones so, is a problem. So all the rest kind of stole your thunder, so, I guess. Yeah, and it's like, Wait, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> and 
it's okay so this this is a similar case of, of uh, yeah of it's it, publishing it's just, a bit too late yeah. maybe it's it, it happens yeah it yeah. happens it I happens, it happens. <laughs> um, so, so so your stories are, are a bit similar so what did you learn from that uh, I, I guess you learned not to take your time exactly right? not to take your time that's the first thing and adjust your <coughs> clock and adjust your clock. <laughs> and adjust your clock. And I, I think I learned from it to make sure that the blog post is automated, not to have a person push the button. Yeah, not to have a person the with a, with a yeah, finger on the button. It's more about like automate things. Yeah. So, Sharon, we, we still want your story about how you tripped yourself. Yeah, sure. So I have a funny failure story. Uh, we're in the vulnerability research business, and we're doing um, a protocol stack uh, vulnerability research. So uh, we're looking at, at a lot of uh, scatter-related protocol stacks, uh, for example, Modbus or uh, Ethernet IP or other protocol stacks. And we tried to identify kind of uh, problematic patterns in protocol stacks implementations. And we were looking at uh, a, a Modbus uh, protocol stack, and we, we kind of analyzed the RFC, the, uh, how it needs to uh, be implemented correctly, and what are all the checks that needs to be uh, enforced. And uh, we found a product that uh, did not have uh, one of the checks. So we thought uh, we could easily bypass it in order to create a denial of service condition. Uh, but we did not check it. So uh, in SCADA, it's very difficult to obtain or purchase these kind of devices. And uh, we kind of had a hard time to emulate the firmware. So we just said to ourselves, uh, OK, it's going to be fine. Uh, you assumed. We, yeah, we assumed, exactly. We assumed. Uh, so uh, we just assume, assumed it to myself. It's compiled. Yeah, we know, we know the protocol. We researched uh, dozens of similar protocol stacks. We know all the checks. And this check here is missing. So for sure, we can bypass it. And uh, we felt very arrogant. And we did not create the POC to reproduce it. Uh, so I just uh, created. Uh, we created our team, uh, created, uh, generated a very uh, thorough report with all the information and screenshots from IDAM and, and screenshots from the RFC of the protocol. Uh, and we sent it to the vendor. And obviously, a couple of days later, the, the vendors uh, wrote us back, thank you very much for the information. Uh, we appreciate uh, your commitment uh, for security, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, we could not reproduce it. Can you share with us the POC? <laughs> And I was. Uh, Trust me, it's more. <laughs> it I was. Uh, setup. I was uh, very uh, ashamed. Yeah. I must say, yeah. uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a glorious failure. Um, and uh, we discussed it a bit uh, with the vendor. We had uh, we jumped on a quick uh, Zoom call. And you and understood uh, that your assumptions were. Yeah, kind and of they wrong. explained us they uh, modified a bit the the protocol, so they used kind of. Uh, esoteric flavor of the protocol that uh, did not need this specific check okay. so because they had other checks in, uh, in different places. Understood. And, and, and I, I want to go back to one of the words you said. Uh, you said you were a bit arrogant yeah. around that. So is arrogance something that um, you revisited in your post-mortem or when you tried to to learn from the process? Yeah, arrogance of course. Arrogance in security research? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Possible. Possible. No, no arrogance? No, so yeah. we obviously analyzed our, our, all of our processes and procedures uh, because uh, it's, it's really unpleasant feeling that you're, you're feeling con full confidence in, your, in yourself and you're sending a report to a vendor and then they're telling you they, they cannot reproduce it. Uh, it's very similar to your story, actually. Uh, so yeah, definitely. For okay, so, after so that we learn. I, I think in general that when we own our failures, when we know that we are the owners, we are to blame maybe, uh, maybe it's easy to, to learn something from it. What about cases where someone else, like a third party or someone you are working with, uh, failed you, caused some sort of failure? Iran, let's start with you. Yeah, I have a good story about that. And I learned from my past mistake and now <laughs> I used an unprivileged shell to do the entire thing. <laughs> So that's a very large uh, AV vendor, European AV vendor, if I may say. And I found uh, two cool uh, local privilege escalation bugs. And I reported that, as usual, responsible disclosure process. Uh, they had some hard time reproducing it, but after a week or so, they succeeded. I thought to myself, OK, great. 
and they said to, to, to me, we will give you the CVE when we patch the product out. I was waiting and waiting, and then I, I see that they patched the product, and I haven't seen any CVEs or any changes in the release notes indicating that they patched the bugs. So I checked if they actually patched the vulnerabilities, and they did. I sent to them an email saying, what happened? Can I have uh, my CVEs, please? And then no response. Another email, even nicer, no response. On the third email, I said, OK, uh, it's, not, it's not cool. That's not the way to treat to security researchers. And after around 10 minutes or so, I got an email starting with the researcher and adding with legal proceeding. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, oh, they said no. to me that I was committed to the bug bounty program, that I had no prior knowledge about it while reporting. And I signed that I cannot publish anything about the bugs because I received money from them, bounty, which I didn't. And I had no clue that there is such a program. Eventually, I contacted the Mitre, the, like the organization that uh, gives new CVEs in mm -hmm. cases that the vendors are not playing by the rules or the vendors are not like, cannot give you any CVEs because they're not a CNA. And I published about one of the vulnerabilities in a blog. But it can happen. Some vendors are not that nice. So you know, that nice, uh, when you're saying not that nice, you mean that they're usually pulling the, the legal card. Yeah, right? they pull the legal card, especially in cases of bug bounty program, which I realized afterwards. Uh, because if you participate in such a program, sometimes you actually say, I will not disclose the information right. in, in uh, public. Okay, but in so here, I just sent an email. I had no clue. So what did you learn from that? That uh, you need to contact Mitra before that, <laughs> <laughs> before anything you do. And that's it. And don't be like, don't take it too seriously when they threaten about it, because usually it has no merit. The threat has no merit. Yeah. I had a similar story to what uh, Ran just described, uh, but I think the lesson, lesson learned is a bit different. Let's um, hear it. We published about uh, an exposed platform that we've detected that is just available to the internet. And it, it, it has a lot of uh, credentials on it, like Slack, Git, and so on. We've detected around like 50 different credentials there. And we published about it once again. You want to share it with the community and so on. And one of the companies that we've detected credentials on this uh, platform reached us and say, hey, you said that we got breached. Well, obviously, that's not what we said, right? And probably the write-up was not uh, clear enough. Yeah. And, and that's where the lesson learned is a bit different, because I think they just didn't understand, and they were threatened by the, the mm -hmm. technical uh, uh, research that, uh, that is in front of them. And once again, they used the, the legal card. Right? They were like, please, remove the logo, remove the article, remove uh, the company, you know, do whatever you can to So while you were talking that. about the vulnerability, they were getting it like you are publishing some sort of of active breach. Right, exactly. And you haven't contacted us and, and, and so on, which is obviously not the case because that's the credentials we've detected on the server. Yeah. They do not own the server, right? Um, so we, what we learn from it is to make sure that the, the text is super clear and you could explain it not to the most technical researcher like, mm -hmm. like us or like uh, Iran, but it needs to be wider, right? You need, we need someone technical, obviously, to read it, but it doesn't have to be too technical. Otherwise, other people could read it and you know, get lost or, or scary. So, so I can tell you just on this specific topic, usually when we publish something, we try to either uh, mention there were no breach or there, we have no evidence of an active breach happening. Mm -hmm. um, this usually closes that, uh, that area. That's good. Of, uh, One of the things we also uh, added to this uh, uh, publication pipe from this, from, this, uh, from this story is to uh, get a review by someone who is not from the research team yeah. To the blog post. Always and have and someone from review. the marketing yeah. and product side mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. review your uh, publication because we always tend to write in geeky language. We love it. It's fine. Uh, it's I, I love to write stuff that Iran will enjoy reading. Yeah. But it, it depends uh, your audience. Exactly. Uh, although Iran would love to read my blogs, 
we also need to make sure that the legal people will love to read my blogs. <laughs> and, and, and also and, less and technical. And those are two different and, and usually it's not the case, especially and, in my case when I report on the vendors exactly. that I said. We always need to make sure that both the run and the legal person would enjoy this blog and won't sue me. So, Irena, <laughs> let's, let's hear uh, a story from you about how someone else wronged you. <laughs> oh, people always wrong me. <laughs> uh, but, We're not um, here to solve all issues. But I think, uh, I, I don't know if when I want to talk about that. I, if, you'll, if you'll allow me, I think uh, I want to talk about something else. Sure, go ahead. You've wronged me. Just <laughs> kidding. Uh, um, I think one of the main reasons we don't talk about failures is because we're really afraid of the fact that people will point fingers. And every time I fail, I'm afraid that someone will blame me for it. And eventually, it, either if I'll tweet about it, I just or uh, if I'll say that um, uh, I did something wrong uh, at work, then I won't get my bonus. So, okay, so like, it's, it's a like, problem, right? It's owning up to the failure. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. You're talking about so, consequences. Exactly. Yeah. Consequences are, are, are no, a bitch. Not, not just naming it's, names and pointing fingers, but actual consequences. Uh, you always need to own up what you do. So it, it, it's a problem. We need to, this is one of those things. You need to always remember that, you, that it's a problem. And this is uh, one of those things that we're afraid of. Yeah. And um, Could be a bad culture of the organization maybe. Because if you, I would like to work in a, in a company where you could take responsibility even on the bad things that happen and won't feel that you'll, you'll get I, fired. I agree so. with you. I'm not sure it's a, it's a cultural thing. I think it's more of a, um, it's, it's, a personal it's not about feeling. organizational thing. It's a I personal think, feeling. Exactly. It's more of a, it's, I think we're all afraid of that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not about organizational thing. It's, you're afraid of it from inherently from you're afraid of it because you're afraid to get fired or you're afraid that you'll lose followers on Twitter. Okay, so, or so Irena, I want to challenge you here. Um, you derailed the subject, so I'm, I'm going to take, it, uh, I just take advantage you. of that. <laughs> what happens when someone from your team, uh, someone that reports to you, fails? Something very, very you know, serious happens. What is your response? How do you help them get back on track? Um, so it's it's very easy. So there are two things that happen. First of all, the question is how did they fail? So if, for example, um, it's an external failure, say you come up to me and you say, hey, your employee just screwed something over. No, he didn't. He was perfect. He did everything well. <laughs> he, he's perfect. He's the best employee in Full the universe. Up. Yeah, he'll get my full support. Okay, so that's the backup you give yeah. uh, in front of it, other, then other areas. Exactly, and um, I'm not looking to, uh, for someone to blame. I'll always look for ways to get better. We'll, we'll find, like, my employees are the best in the universe. We'll find, in, in, in closed rooms, we'll figure out what went wrong. We'll, we'll figure out, okay, we didn't do this right. The process needs to get uh, fixed. We need to do this, 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 and this better. We need to figure out how to uh, solve the issue that made this uh, problem. Uh, probably wasn't my employee's direct uh, issue, right? It might be that he didn't know how to do something, yeah. but then it's my fault. You need okay. to own the problem. It's not your employee's so, problem. So it's ownership, your problem. ownership, positive thinking, uh, and owning good feedback, up, and, and owning backup. up your employee's and problem. Definitely yeah. back up and, and try to pull them out of the gutter because we kind of tend to punish ourselves more than others even mm -hmm. punish us, right? Yeah. We are the harshest critics of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. I also think it's management. It's, um, it's never the small researcher's problem. It's always the management chain. Yeah. Like, yeah, you need to have a proper environment to encourage people to admit their fuck-ups. It's important for people to feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. It takes a lot of courage to go to your manager and say, hey, I did a mistake, right? Dramatic one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Failed. And, and at the end of the day, you, you need to own up that even if 
someone in your team did a mistake, you're responsible for mm -hmm. it. Yeah, right. You need to own up for it. And if they didn't follow up procedure, it's your responsibility so we will, to we will validate and yeah. prove it. Okay, Sharon, you, you mentioned before, uh, you said SCADA. And when you say SCADA, uh, or in general, ICS-related vendors, manufacturers, we think of dinosaurs, to be honest. <laughs> you really think about dinosaurs. How are they responding to, to uh, vulnerability disclosures? Um, what is the response? Are they actually happy for people uh, are trying to break their stuff? How, is it go how does it go in this weird ecosystem? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, actually, because as you said, uh, SCADA, um, cybersecurity SCADA is something new. Uh, SCADA, SCADA systems ha have been existed for many years before the, uh, the new IT world. And many of these vendors are not familiar with the cybersecurity aspects because in SCADA, you need the devices to run smoothly. So you don't have... Uh, redundant CPU cycles to burn on checks, cybersecurity checks, because you needed the critical machines to work uh, uh, flawlessly. So in the past, there were no uh, security checks and there, were no, uh, there, was no, there, was no con there was no concept of cybersecurity in, in SCADA, no uh, usernames, no passwords, uh, no uh, binary uh, exploitation mitigations, nothing. Uh, so all of these concepts are kind of new to the vendors. Uh, and they're trying to keep up with the, the modern cybersecurity era. Uh, so the big, the big vendors uh, in, in the SCADA world uh, are quite familiar uh, now with uh, the modern cybersecurity aspects and they do have a very organized procedures for uh, re reporting of vulnerability, having a, a very organized procedures for uh, product security, uh, how to receive reports from uh, emails. So, so they're familiar with it more because of active disclosures or because the industry itself is growing, um, educating itself? What, yeah. what is changing though? Exactly. So I think... Uh, because new players, new cybersecurity defense companies like ours, Clarity, uh, came into, in, into the world and started to check these devices and report on the vulnerabilities on these devices, these vendors uh, started to learn and we, ki we kind of uh, educated the entire market uh, and I think we're improving it as a community. We're improving the, the cybersecurity market in the SCADA world and domains, and now vendors are much more uh, uh, appreciating cybersecurity researchers poking so, at so their devices. So you're saying basically there was a gap, or there is a gap, mm -hmm. but we're quickly closing that? Yeah, we're... Because that's we're awesome to hear. Exactly. We're, we're definitely closing the gap in cybersecurity research and the acceptance of cyber, uh, SCADA vendors uh, for the security uh, reports and vulnerabilities in their, their products. And we can see that because uh, in, I think, the past uh, one or two years, we've seen many new vendors uh, implementing new cybersecurity uh, procedures for receiving uh, uh, research reports and acting upon it. So improving the security of their products, issuing advisories, uh, communicating this transparently to their users and customers. So we are seeing a great improvement. That's awesome. That's really awesome. And, and actually, I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah. I was under the impression it, it is happening, but, uh, but it sounds better when you say that, when mm -hmm. you actually handle that uh, on a daily basis. Uh, Eran, I'm going back to you because before this, uh, uh, before this panel, we kind of discussed what kind of talks are relevant for, for the Intent Summit or other technical uh, or more technical, less technical summits and conferences. Is it interesting for you to attend not only as a participant, but someone who will come and visit a panel or a talk about failures? Yeah, surely. For instance, that was uh, a quick answer. Yeah, because <laughs> it's a definitely it's a definite yes. Uh, for instance, a lot in the vulnerability research business, you do you use fuzzing nowadays more than ever to find bugs, 
And while you do a project that you look for new bugs and you use a fuzzer, one of the hardest things is actually to build the environment and to configure it to work properly. So even if you had the best mindset to where to look bugs, you understand the protocol, the structure, the driver, or whatever, you sometimes have some hard times building the environment correctly. And if I hear a talk about someone that struggled for two, three months to actually build the environment, and from my own personal experience, I went through those hardships as well. And, so, and I thought to myself actually that maybe that's not the way. It's too difficult, I should quit. And I think that if people hear other people quitting as well, it's okay, because it makes them feel better and more encouraged to continue, to continue and work harder in those elements. Also, we should, we should share more of our, I think, the way we do things and not just the end, end goal things, not just like the primitive, the exploits that we do, but more about the research uh, mindset that we had along the way to achieve those things. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's very, very interesting. Um, I'm starting to think that maybe you go to these talks, uh, you know, to, to see other people are frustrated as well. It's okay. And yeah, it's good. No, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's part of being a community. It's a, not only it's a, being a security researcher, especially a vulnerability researcher, is a difficult job because of the emotional as aspects of that as well. You like, you break your head against a wall for like, could be for a month or so, and then you have like a small miracle, you discover something and you go for it with full power, and then you discover it's nothing, or the other way around. So it's very important to understand that other people have those hardships as well. It's not just you, you are not alone in the world. It's, Everyone have it. It's definitely true. Uh, it's been talked a lot recently that um, being in security research is very, sometimes be very frustrating and very, um, a lot of people feel the mental uh, stress of it. Demanding. It's very demanding. To and find yeah, something, to find a vulnerability, but sometimes it's just not there. Yeah, it's, and, and it's research, you know. It's, at the end of the day, 90% of research is failure. And you, you have this hypothesis uh, that you, you will end up winning. Yeah, so, so we, we can will. never have KPIs on the findings because you can exactly. easily do a three months research that ends with a no. no. Oh, yes, right. The way we Agreed. deal with this, by the way, it's, it, it's a really good topic because it's hard to define KPIs for success in vulnerability research. So what we do before defining the KPIs for finding a vulnerability, because maybe it's not there, what we're doing is defining uh, the KPIs for um, covering the attack surface. So the first thing we're trying to do is we're trying to go over the product, see how the product is working on a normal basis, and then we're trying to cover the attack vectors, uh, how you communicate with it, whether it's a network, a file the input, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of interactions you have with this product or, dev or device. And only then we're trying to uh, dig inside and try to uncover uh, the unseen attack surface, and only once we have uh, a few days or weeks of research, only then we're trying to, to define the KPIs for finding a vulnerability. Okay, so, so I, I think that I already have the topic for the panel of next year, uh, because all of you somehow included the disclosure process or the findings in that. Um, a question that comes from, from our audience at the moment, uh, another one is, when we look uh, at, at the response of, uh, of the vendors or, or our targets, let's call it, we are very dependent on their replies, on, their, on the, the way that they actually talk to us and, and communicate with us. What do we do with those who just go completely silent? Um, I, I don't want you to mention any names, obviously, in your, mm -hmm. in your uh, response, but what do we do with those who go sil silent? Uh, even when sometimes the findings are uh, extremely severe. Um, I don't know, SCADA can be life-threatening. Yeah, we're, we're right? working very closely with uh, ICS-CERT, 
which is the third organization dealing with uh, ICS equipment. And they, they are great. Uh, we're just communicating and uh, they're helping us with coordinating all the vulnerability disclosures. And it, the conversation with them is just open and... and so, so that's around ICS. What yeah. about others? Ari, do you have any experience yeah, in, in with and I, silent, uh, silent disclosures? Yeah, so, so sometimes the victims, they just do not answer. I mean, what can you do? You try to reach them via email or their website or... Uh, law enforcement, you know, or even national certs, but if they do not answer, then there's nothing. Uh, like, we're doing the best, right, to reach them. We're trying to use even personal connections and such, but sometimes they just, they don't pick up the phone or email or fax even. Iran, you know? <laughs> so, you're nodding. Is it yeah, I agree, and I actually can tell a recent story about that, that I found some nice bugs in a PCI maker company. Uh, we shall continue to be nameless until one week from now, maybe. Okay. And the nice, way... Nice plug-in. <laughs> Go ahead. The, the way I got to them eventually was through two different hoops in the chain. From Microsoft, because they had some drivers that are signed by Microsoft, and then, and then by another company. And then the entire conversation with them was very, very difficult. And it took them more than one year to actually to patch the bags. But at least they answered. Okay. Yeah. And in the, in the end, they answered. But in some other occasions, I said to myself, okay, I'm trying my best. I send them every email that I can. But if they do not respond, I'm telling them, okay, I'll publish it. I disclose it in the public. And if they do not respond, then you've, de you've done your best. And that's perfectly fine for me if I've done my best to publish my findings. Okay, Irena, they don't respond. What do you do? Zero communication. I don't do vulnerability research. Oh, right, I right. don't have an opinion, thank right. God. <laughs> I don't need to have this problem, so. Ari, zero response, what do you do? Yeah, so again, with, uh, with the malware analysis and threats, sometimes you do detect uh, uh, victims that are uh, dealing with an attack uh, at the moment. And uh, besides, you know, try to reach them any way you can through, again, law enforcement or uh, national certs. That's the best you can do. We even uh, send some uh, messages on LinkedIn. <laughs> but <laughs> By the way, big players in the market like ZDI and uh, Project Zero of Google have a very, rest very uh, concrete, uh, let's say, deadline. 90 day policy. Nin 90, 90 days, days. Yeah. and that's it. Yeah. So 90 days, you answer, you don't answer, it's out. They even yeah, but you want to be nice, right? You, you want to be nice. We're, we're, we're giving much They even much do it to large vendors, vendors as well, not just to small vendors. Like Port yeah, Zillow so doesn't care less to publish I, I bugs. Think, I think that the 90-day rule is, is kind of the rule of thumb currently in the industry, right? Unless they actually give you an explicit okay to go before that. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is uh, we're first trying to communicate with the vendor if they don't answer, we try again via email. If they don't answer, we're uh, trying to approach ICS cert, and then we're working and okay. coordinating everything through ICS cert. Okay, so we are almost out of time. I'm going to ask you uh, for a quick answer uh, for the next question. Uh, let's see if we can have some, some take home message of how to actually improve the culture of sharing all these failures, all these uh, screw ups, fuck ups, whatever you want to call them, but when something does not succeed, um, how do we do that? Although there might be, we might put them in the spotlight and there might be, as you said, Irena, consequences. So Sharon, yeah, start so with, with your idea. I, I definitely think that uh, we should, uh, when we're publishing our research, we should definitely talk about the dead ends, the path that went nowhere, and uh, mention them in order to inspire other people not to go there or to think of other creative ways to uh, circumvent this path. Okay. Yeah, I very much agree with Sharon. I think that we should also do post-mortem to understand what went well in this research process, what can be improved, and by that, do better next time. Iran, your quick review? Yeah, I agree, and I think that conferences should also include those kind of talks about failures along the way, and companies need to reward their employees based on, based on the effort and not just the end result. And Irena, your final sentence here. I'll, uh, I think that we should adopt the Nike motto, just do it. All of us, both as companies and as security researchers, let's use our Twitter power and just do it, just 
share our failures on Twitter. Excellent. Sounds good, and we're going to just do it. So <laughs> thank you so much for this uh, eye-opening discussion. That was really great. I hope every one of you will continue succeeding and failing every now and then. <laughs> uh, thank you, our audience, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the sessions. We'll see you in a very, very similar uh, panel next year. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.